Whites make up about 63% of the population, and within Hollywood, they make up between 74% and 96%, uh, whether you're measuring behind the scenes from studio heads to directors to writers, as well as in front of the scenes in terms of actors. So um, historically, uh, white males have financed the stories that are directed by white men, written by white men, and starring white men, and even um, evaluated and rewarded by white men in the Academy, as we saw with Oscar So White uh, hashtag. And, um, and this has resulted in uh, all the 2016 nominations in terms of uh, Best Pictures. They were all white stories, and most of those were about white men overcoming obstacles. And so you can see that systemically, there, it, it is an industry that is dominated by women, both historically and contemporarily. So Hollywood brands itself as a progressive liberal industry that is pro-diversity, but in, in reality, it is one of the biggest perpetuators of racism. And so it does this through what I call colorblind racism, where uh, essentially um, the industry folks uh, perpetuate implicit bias and they demonstrate implicit bias in the way that they select projects, in the way that they hire, and in the stories that they choose to tell. And so they refuse to acknowledge that they actually have these implicit biases, but instead want to blame um, like the one or two movies that they choose to star uh, people of color as not doing well at the box office. But this is just a matter of uh, chance, right? When there are, let's say, 100 movies that are made about whites, and if a few of them flop, they don't attribute it to race. But then if they only fund a few projects that are starring people of color or women, uh, all that attention is placed on those. And so it's, it's an unfair comparison. So I interviewed almost 100 actors, um, including actors of color as well as white actors. And there was a big difference where actors of color really had these burdens of representation where they do, did not want to perpetuate stereotypes. They really wanted to represent their racial ethnic groups well. And so in order to do that, and in order to kind of protect themselves psychologically from the shame and the... Um, and the, the negativity that came with having to portray demeaning roles, they would subvert as well as challenge stereotypes. So for example, um, I had one actor, Asian American actor, who she, was, she played a, um, a Chinatown trinket owner. And that owner was asked, that character was, she was supposed to wear a kimono. And she refused to wear a kimono, and she did so by negotiating with the director by telling him that, well, you know, if I were actually running a, a, a shop 24-7, that I probably wouldn't be wearing a kimono. And so she was able to, to negotiate that and defeat that stereotype because the costume becomes this racial marker for stereotype, right, of the exotic, the foreign, the other. Um, the hashtag, I think, uh, really allowed a lot of people, audiences, lay people who were not part of the industry to be able to protest, as well as people in the industry. And I think that um, when it happened again the second time around the Oscar ceremony, uh, director Spike Lee and actor Jada Pinkett Smith uh, joined that movement and were able to say that we're not going to, we're just going to boycott the, the Oscars altogether. And that really uh, mobilized the Academy to make some real changes. So um, the president, Cheryl Boone Isaacs, uh, within days of them announcing their non-attendance of the ceremony, they, um, they announced that they would revise the, the membership um, admission uh, processes, right? And so they, they didn't say exactly what they were going to do. They promised change to come. And in June of this year, they actually, in 2016 June, they actually uh, invited um, 683 new members, and 46% of those members were women, and 41% were people of color. So that is a huge step in the right direction. But if